Rachel, and today we're going to talk about how to take a pipeline for NLP that was originally developed for English and some of the components that you might need to add to it to make it work for a different language in NLP for developers. For reasons of both history and also convenience, many NLP pipelines and tools were originally developed for English. And what this means is that there were a lot of assumptions about how languages work and behave that were built into these pipelines that don't necessarily maintain beyond English. So for example, if you remove capitalization from English, you don't lose a lot of grammatical information. Uh, the only sort of class that's usually capitalized is proper nouns like names. And However, if you remove capitalization from German, you're going to lose a lot of grammatical information. And that's because nouns are capitalized in German. So removing that capitalization removes a lot of information about parts of speech and say, might make your part of speech tag or not work so good. Another example is using words as the subunit that your NLP system treats as the smallest unit. For languages like Tagalog, where words tend to be made up of many subword units, you'll end up with an enormous vocabulary, and you'll also still get out of vocabulary errors when you see new combinations of subpieces that you've seen previously. So maybe not the best approach for that type of language. Today we're going to talk about five specific techniques that you might need to add to an NLP pipeline for a language other than English. And I will say these are just some of the techniques that you might need. What your particular pipeline is, is really going to depend on your language and your specific needs, uh, but this should be enough to hopefully get the majority of people watching this video started. Let's start with diacritic restoration. Diacritic restoration is taking a text string that the diacritics have been removed from and placing them back in. Diacritics are things like accent marks in French or Portuguese, or tone marks in some African languages where they're a little bit optional in informal writing. This is only really necessary for languages that use diacritics in the first place, um, and it's especially important when you are using sort of informal, chit-chatty type of text. And the reason for this is that, particularly for languages that don't have a lot of corpora or training texts, the texts that exist will often be very formal, so they'll be literature or textbooks or dictionaries written in a very formal academic style where all the diacritics are there. So adding the diacritics back in means that your training data will match your test data a little bit better. Another task is word segmentation. This is really only important for languages where there is no uh, written segmentation between the words. For example, in Chinese, there aren't spaces between different words that are written as one long text string. Because each character has meaning on its own, it's sometimes ambiguous where the boundary between words should be. So we have here a three character phrase that can mean physics or physicist, but each character on its own also has meaning. So where do you slice the text in order to have the most meaningful units and also the units that the author originally intended? This task is only really important for languages where this is ambiguous. So particularly languages without white space between words. Um, that includes CJK for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, uh, Thai, Vietnamese. And the most common approach to this is to use a pre-trained language specific segmenter. So you'd use a Chinese word segmenter segmentation algorithm for your Chinese text, you'd use a you know, Vietnamese one for your Vietnamese text, and so on. The next three tasks on our list, stemming, lemmatization, and morphological parsing, all have to do with morphemes. A morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a language. So a word may have one morpheme, like language, you can't really break that down any further. Or it may have multiple morphemes. For example, cats is made up of the morpheme cat and the morpheme s that means multiple or plural. And underdog is made up of the morpheme under and the morpheme dog. Let's start with stemming. Stemming is the process of removing all of the morphemes that came in a word after the main morpheme or the root morpheme, the one that contributes the most to the word's meaning. So here you can see we've taken develop ing and removed the ing to make it developed. The contextual, we've removed the al to make it contextu. And where the particular word boundary is drawn is going to depend on the particular stemmer you're using. Um, this one here is the snowball stemmer. Why would you use stemming? So it's a fairly quick and dirty approach. Um, it's most helpful if you want to consider all words that share the same wor root morpheme together. So for example, if you want to consider development, developing, developed, and developer as a single group for whatever your text processing task is, then you would do something like stemming. 
stemming. It tends to work best with languages that are suffix heavy. So suffixes are morphemes that come after the root. If a language only puts them after the root, stemming is great because you can just knock them off. But if you also put a lot of morphemes before the root, stemming won't remove them. And often this is rule-based. Next is lemmatization. A lemma is basically the dictionary form of a word. So it's the word you would look up if you wanted to know the meaning of something, um, ignoring the, the sort of grammatical information that was added to it because of its, its context. So uh, in this example, instead of taking contextual and reducing it to context you, uh, lemmatization would recognize, oh, contextual, the root of contextual is context, that's the lemma, and then return context. It's a much more robust approach than stemming, which just sort of knocks things off the end. It can remove things from both sides, it can remove things from the middle, uh, and it will identify the root form of the word. It does generally rely on a high quality dictionary, so resources that have been built by hand and are language specific. It's a much more careful process, it's oftentimes a lot slower, but you get much higher quality data out. Finally, morphological parsing. Stemming and lemmatization find you the root of a word. Morphological parsing breaks a word down into all of its components and also describes how they're related to each other. So here we have two possible morphological parses, unlockable, which is unlock plus able, and that means that something can be unlocked, and unlockable, which is lockable plus un at the front, which means something cannot be locked. So these, uh, the morphological parsing here is what would allow you to disambiguate between these two words, and the segmentation is what you would allow you to identify that unlockable is unlockable. This is most important for languages where uh, the morphological processes are very rich, very productive, and a lot of words will be made up of many morphemes in a row, and modeling their relationship to each other is important to understanding the meaning of the word. Morphological parsers are often hand-built, um, finite state machines are sort of the classical approach here, um, or they can be trained using supervised machine learning, assuming you have a training data set for them. Uh, and you would use morphological parsing instead of something like stemming or lemmatization when removing everything but the root would mean that you remove a lot of information that's included in the word. And finally, some common errors and gotchas for moving from English to other languages. A really big one that I see is that um, if you're working in a language other than English, you're going to have access to large corpora. Um, it is possible that you may not be able to access large corpora that exist. It's also very possible that large corpora just simply don't exist in a language, but you still want to be able to develop technology that can help people, and this is where a little bit more of a rule-based system can be helpful. Another common assumption that I see, uh, particularly from people who are working in languages that have you know, slightly more resources, is that you'll be able to translate from English to the target language pretty well. Machine translation can sometimes be a step in these pipelines, knowing that it will introduce its own sort of foibles and weirdnesses, but the unfortunate thing is that if a language doesn't have a lot of NLP resources to begin with, machine translation on it is not going to be good. So if there's no corpus, or if there is a corpus but it's of very low quality, or say there's a corpus but it's made up of three very distinct varieties of the language which haven't been labeled, uh, machine translation might end up with something that's really garbled and not usable. If you're looking for more resources, um, I really recommend the book Linguistic Fundamentals for Natural Language Processing, 100 Essentials for Morphology and Syntax by Emily Bender. So morphology is the study of word parts and how they fit together, and then syntax is the study of how words fit together in a longer sentence. Um, and Emily's also written one on semantics and pragmatics, which is more about meaning, if that's something that interests you. Specific tools, Spacey does have support for languages other than English, and we also already have that um, incorporated into the RASA pipeline, so you might be able to find some existing tools for your target language there. Uh, and Stanza is a project by Stanford NLP that has, uh, again, more tools for more languages. I think it has about 66. It's not going to cover everybody, but it may cover your particular need, so uh, maybe something to check out. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you found this helpful and it's given you some more information about things that you might need to think about if you are working on a language that's not English and some of the processing that you might do in order to find better results for your particular work. And I look forward to seeing what you build. I'll talk to you later.